got to say that uh, as a pastor and as a dad, I am full and hearing those reports. And I had, uh, Jeannie and I had three of our children in this team. So, and I think watching the video and seeing you guys do that, I've been there a couple of times myself in the past 25 years and to see the context and just see what God can do in a life, through a life, to touch a life by just putting yourself in a place where you're willing to be used, however. And you don't listen to me. You don't have to go to El Salvador to experience that. So Pastor Luke is talking about, you know, altar calls that they had in their programs on the street in a school. And I say, let's have that here in our church. So this morning at the end, we're going to pray for salvation. If anyone wants to open their heart and life and give their life to Jesus and respond that way, you're going to have an opportunity to do that. If you've got a problem today of some kind, anything in your family, in your life, something that you're struggling with, we're going to pray for that. And if you need healing today, we're going to open up time to pray for people who need God's healing. And I believe that we can see God's miracles happen when we put our faith and trust in Him and just come with an expecting heart and an expecting attitude saying, God, I know that you're able to do all these things. It's not hard for you. So if we come expecting that, I believe God's going to meet us here and do some miraculous, amazing things when we surrender and open our heart and life to Jesus. So uh, proud of Pastor Luke and Jenna and Pastor Zach and all the leaders and students for uh, what you've done. And it, it's a life-changing experience, and I know that uh, we'll see the fruit of that for, for years to come. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're in a series in 1 Corinthians And this morning, the message that I want to uh, share with you, I've entitled More Than You Can Handle. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, We're going to be reading a passage of Scripture, the first 13 verses in chapter 10. And uh, so if you've got it in your Bible or on your device, if you'll follow along. If you don't have that, it's on the screen. I'm going to be reading this morning from the New Living Translation. Uh, So follow along and uh, let's, let's read. Starting verse 1, I don't want you to to forget, this is Paul writing again in 1 Corinthians, he says, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Verse 6, these things happened as a warning to us, so that we would not crave evil things as they did, or worship idols as some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test as some of them did, and then died from snake bites. And don't grumble as some of them did, and then were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Verse 12, if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. This morning I want to ask you, what do you say to someone who is going through an enormous trial, who's suffering and it seems like their life is falling apart. Maybe they've lost a job. Maybe they've lost a spouse. Maybe a home. Maybe a child. Something has happened in their life and maybe they've lost all sense of purpose. What can you, what do you say to bring comfort to them? One of the phrases that I, I, I hear a lot, and I have to be honest, I've probably said this, and I'm thinking probably many of you have said that as well, and it's this, uh, this, this phrase that God will never give you more than you can handle, which is true concerning temptation. We just read this passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 13 in the NIV says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So you see that this this phrase, this verse that, that we're talking about here isn't about trials and it's not about suffering. It's about specifically about temptation. 
God does promise in temptation that he'll make a way out when we're tempted. But in Scripture, it never says anything that God will shield us from suffering. Contrary, the Scripture says a lot of things. Here's just a couple of things. Uh, John 16, in this world you will have trouble. He says, here on this earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, for I've overcome the world. First, 2 Timothy 3, 12 says, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So we understand that there are trials and there's suffering in this world because we live in a fallen world. And Jesus said it, the scriptures say it over and over, be ready, it's going to happen, this is going to come, because that's just part of the world that we live in. But we've got this phrase, uh, God will never give you more than you can handle. And we're going to pick that apart in just a moment. But first of all, what I want to do is I want to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want to uh, do a little bit of teaching in the context of chapter 10. And then I'm going to finish by uh, kind of bringing a little bit better understanding of this misconception of, of uh, the phrase, God will never give us more than we can handle. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we see that the, the context is clearly about temptation. God told Cain, back at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, he says, uh, Cain, sin is crouching at your door, and it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. And I think we all understand this thought, this concept, that sin is stalking us. It's out to get us, and we will become victims of it if we don't become masters over it and rule over it, as God told Cain. But how many of us can vouch that it is nearly impossible to overcome sin, to overcome temptation in our own ability, in our own power? Anybody identify with that? You see, temptation is uh, something that we all face. There is not one person in this room, and I believe that there's not one person on the face of earth that is immune to temptation. Even Jesus went through temptation when he was here on this earth, yet he did not sin. Jesus told his disciples, Matthew 26, 41, he said, watch and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So the previous verses of chapter 10, Paul retells the history of God's people all the way back in Israel uh, as they were um, in in the wilderness. They were prone to fall into sin. Verse five says that God wasn't pleased with most of them. And verse 6 gives us an idea of why it's important that we look to the Old Testament, why we read all of the Scripture and why that's good for us. And it says, in verse 6, it says, you'll remember, now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. We can learn from what they have done. We can learn uh, to do right by looking what the Israelites did wrong. And so I want to just walk through like four vantage points for how that we overcome sin or how we battle uh, and deal with temptation. The first one is to look back. Verse 11, chapter 10 says, these things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. And I believe as Christians, we need to uh, take some time uh, at times and just stop. We need to stop, we need to kind of look back uh, and remember the lessons that we've learned in life. We learn a lot of lessons from the examples of other people. We can learn lessons that are lessons from things that went wrong, we can learn lessons from things that went right, and too often we learn lessons from our own mistakes. But we need to look back and and remember, look back and learn. You can watch uh, America's Funniest Home Videos and learn some things. How not to go down a hill uh, filled with snow. Uh, You learn how not to groom a cat. You learn why it's not a good idea to jump on a trampoline from your roof. I mean, we, we, we can learn from other people's examples of what we should do or what we should not do. We learn from our own failures. How many of you can say, uh, I, I did that and that didn't work, and you should write those kind of things down saying, note to self, don't do this again, right? Or maybe you've, you've done something and you thought, wow, uh, I need to chalk that one up and I didn't even remember that. that, that did the trick. So what lessons do we learn from Israel's past? Just going back through these verses very quickly. Verse 6, it said that they craved evil things. And the Bible tells us that we need to desire the things of God. Verse 7 says that they were idolaters. As Christians, our our goal, our, our perspective is God and Him alone. 
No other gods, nothing before God, nothing besides God. God and him alone. Verse 8 says that they were sexually immoral, and the Bible tells us to flee all kinds of sexual immorality. Verse 9 says that they tested God over and over, but Scripture tells us that we're not to put God to the test. Verse 10 talks about them grumbling. It says that they grumbled. Moses, what are you doing bringing us out here? What are we going to do? What are we going to eat? Why why did you bring us out here? What are we going to drink? We just want to go back to Egypt. They complained, they grumbled, they, they, they were moaning about the way things are. And, the, and, and, and we cannot be complainers. Don't just look at life and think of everything that's wrong and be a complainer. We need, to, we need to have a thankful heart. Be thankful for what God has done. There are blessings in our lives and we need to be thankful. And when we have an attitude of thankfulness, we'll see all kinds of reason to give God thanks. Verse 12 uh, says that they were proud. And at the core of sin is pride. Pride saying, we think that we know what's best for our lives. But 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, if you think that you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So while it's important for us to remember the lessons of the past, uh, we can't dwell in the past. Isaiah 43, 18 says, forget the former things, don't dwell on the past. He says, oh, I'm doing, see, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in a wasteland. So we can't dwell on past hurts. We can't just hang in the past thinking of all the things that were done to us, all the hurts that came to us, because what we'll do is we will effectively just disengage from going forward. We can't be stuck in the past. It's time for us to look at the past, remember what we've been through, forgive, and move on. God is doing, he says, I'm doing a new thing. Look, I'm moving forward. Time is moving forward. God is moving forward. We, can't, we can learn from the past. We just can't stay there. Don't dwell in the past. So we look back. The second thing that we can do is look out. 1 Peter 5, 8, Peter says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We're to be on alert because temptation is out there. I promise you today, Temptation will come to most all of you. Be on the lookout. It's going to happen. It comes. And when it comes, we got to realize I'm not immune from it affecting me. So be on the lookout. Look back, look out, look up. The psalmist says in Psalm 121.1, I look to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Chapter 10, verse 13, God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So put your focus on the faithfulness of God. God is faithful. He won't let you down. He won't fail you. Look up. God is your help. Look around is the the fourth thing. Look around and and see the escape route. And take that escape route as, 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 don't hesitate to take that right away. When you're tempted, Scripture says, God will provide a way out so that you can endure it. So just just look at that passage one more time and, and review. No temptation. These six things that we talked about that the Israelites did and even more. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Listen, your temptation is no different than the person sitting next to you. The things that you face aren't just unique to you. Sin is sin. Temptation comes to all of us. We're not unique. We're not unusual. Everyone faces them. So realize that no, uh, no temptation has overtaken you except what everybody has, has, has experienced. And God is faithful. You can count on him. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. With Christ, you can handle the temptation, any temptation. But when you're tempted, he will provide a way out. It's like the idea of an army being surrounded by its enemy. And at a moment, they see an opening, a way of escape. And you've got to take it when it comes, and you leave and you go. You retreat, you get out of there. The scripture pr- promises that God will make a way out so that you can endure through it. So be on the lookout so that you can endure it. So let's, I want to, I want to use the rest of our time going back to this common quote that God won't give us more than we can handle. And I want to make a couple of observations about that and then we'll just end in prayer today. So the phrase is definitely, we've, we've um, made this conclusion that it definitely is concerning temptation. Uh, and it's not true, nor do I believe that it's scriptural when it comes to our trials and our suffering. You see, People face way more than they can handle. How many of you have experienced that? Most of you have been through something in your life that you had a perspective on the front side 
I don't know how I'm ever going to make it through this. Praise God you're here today. How many of you have experienced that before? I've been through that too. I've been to the place where I thought it would just be so convenient if when I laid down at night, whether it, if I could even go to sleep, that if I go to sleep, it would be just so awesome if I just didn't wake up in the morning and have to deal with what's facing me. We've all been through things like that. Maybe we've come through a trial or some kind of suffering. Maybe, maybe it's something just around the corner. Maybe you find yourself in that right at this moment. There's something that you're facing, something that you're going through. You're feeling overwhelmed. I think about Job and Joseph in the Old Testament, or Peter, John, or Paul in the New Testament. Just look at this passage of Scripture back in the, in the book of Job. Just read through these verses with me. Uh, Job chapter 1, verse 13. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at, Joseph's, or at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabians raided uh, us. They stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I'm the only one that has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up all your sheep and all your shepherds. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived with this news. Three bands of Chaldean ra- raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and your daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home, and suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed, and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Can you imagine what that day would be like? Imagine getting that kind of news, looking for an answer, and someone says, Oh, Job, it's okay. God won't give you more than you can handle. Hmm. What did Job do? Verse 20 says, he stood up, he tore his robe in grief, he shaved his head, and he fell to the ground to worship. Job looked to God. In the New Testament, Paul speaks of his own experience in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And he says this about himself. He says, I've worked harder I've been put in prison more often. I've been whipped times without number. I've faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers and robbers. I've faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I've faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I've faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long and enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. But verse 30 says, if I must boast, I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. James says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of various kinds. Because the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance, when it finishes its work, it will make you uh, mature and complete, not lacking anything. Romans chapter 5 verse 3 says we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance. And so scripture is clear that that, that there is help and that that these troubles, these things will come. And and listen, we're not called to be Superman or, or Wonder Woman. That's not what we're called to do. We need to admit that we don't have what it takes to handle the suffering and the trials that life brings our way. But the Bible constantly directs us to put our hope and our trust not in our abilities, but in God. So this common phrase, God won't give you more than you can handle. I want you to just think about that. God won't give you more than you can handle. It seems to make it all about me and my ability to do something about it. The reality is, at times, I'm overwhelmed. How many of you felt overwhelmed? And then we feel guilty because we're struggling. We think, you know what? God's not giving me more than I can handle. I should be okay, and I'm not. I'm not okay. What's wrong with me? 
And it also would seem to imply that God is the one that's giving the trials and the suffering. God won't give you more than you can handle. It's just, he's just, he's just uh, being nice about it and not giving us too much. But listen, God's not the one bringing the suffering to us. God's not the one that's bringing temptation to us. The Bible says that God doesn't tempt anyone in James chapter 1, but temptation comes when we're, we're dragged away and enticed by our own evil desires. The enemy is, is, is tempting us, and our own evil, sinful nature is tempting us. God's not tempting us. The Bible tells us that God makes a way out of that for us, and God will help us to endure through the, the suffering and through the trials. He's never leaving us. He's always there for us. So here's what I want uh, to propose to you, that we would just do away with that phrase. It's in the Bible. I I, I don't know any other place in the Bible it would come from than verse 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But it has to deal with temptation, and it just doesn't quite fit with our suffering and our trials. But I think this would be a better way if we just kind of did away with that and didn't say that anymore and and said something like this. It'll be on on the screen for you. Life may give you more than you can handle. Life may give you more than you can handle, but never more than God can handle. Does that seem to make more sense to us? We certainly know that there are times when life is overwhelming and life brings us troubles, but God has never left us and he's never overwhelmed. Paul was overwhelmed. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, he says, we We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles that we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, and listen to this, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. We thought it was just over. But listen to what he says after this. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. We felt this sentence of death, but listen, we can't rely on ourselves. We're, we're inept to do this. We can't do it ourselves. We need God. God is the one who can raise the dead. God can do in our life whatever he wants to. Here's a, here's a key phrase that I want you to remember this morning. The Christian life is not a journey from dependence to independence, but instead a process of moving from arrogant self-reliance to deep spiritual dependence on God. For everything. Let me say that again. The Christian life. It's not a journey from dependence to independence. That's, that's human nature. We want to we do it ourselves. We want to think we can be smart enough. We want to think we can be strong enough. We got to be able to handle it, right? But instead, it's a process of moving from, from self-reliance to deep spiritual dependence on God for everything. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. You see this thing that goes on of this reliance on God and God's power in us? Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5 says, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. So just to summarize real briefly, We need to, when it comes to facing temptation, look for the way of escape because God promises that he won't put more temptation on us than we can handle and he promises that he will make a way of escape when we're tempted. God doesn't tempt us. The enemy does. Our own sinful nature draws us away. But we need to look for the escape. Number two, expect trials. Expect them. They've come this far in life, they're they're not gonna stop. And number three, in the midst of trials and suffering, lean in and trust God. When you're going through that, lean in and trust the Lord. Here's the thing. Every single one of us in this room, we need to be utterly dependent on God and his power and his strength in our life because you can't, I can't, none of us can make it on our own. This church, we need God's power. Not so that we can say how great we are, but so we can say how great God is. And I'm believing today that God's going to move in our lives as we surrender ourselves and offer ourselves to him. So I'd like to invite you to stand this morning, and here's what we want to do to close. I just want to invite all of you to come 
and find a place here. Today, we're going to respond by saying, I want God in my life. We need him. We need his power in our life. We need his power in our life to live a daily Christian life, to overcome sin and overcome temptation. So if that's you today, just come. This morning, if you need power in your life to face the trials and the difficulties, and if there's no one here that's immune to any of this. So please, come. Let's offer ourselves to him. Let's invite God's presence and ask for his power to come on our lives, to move in us, to use us, to affect the world around us. Not just wait for a team to go to El Salvador and say, you know what, that was people's lives who were changed. Let's see lives changed right here at New Hope Assembly. Let's see lives changed right here in Urbandale and in the city of Des Moines. And let God use us. But listen, we can't do it ourselves. We need God's power, every one of us today. So I wanna invite you to come. And we're going to pray and we're going to ask God to to meet us and, and meet us where we have problems, to meet us where we have temptations. There are people in this room today who are battling sin of the worst kind. You're struggling and you're paralyzed because of uh, pornography addiction, because of some other addiction in your life. And today, we're not asking you to come and give your, uh, your report to the church, but come and say, God, I need your power. I know that I'm just a day away from something disaster coming on my life. It happens on all of us. We see lives here. There are people here today who have disease, people who their families falling apart. There's situations that are going on. And listen, it could be us because we live in a world that's fallen. And how many of you need God's power? You know that you can't do it on your own. If you guys would just move forward a little bit to make more room because there's more people that are going to be coming. challenge you this morning to offer yourself to God. Let him move. This morning, there's people in the room who need to give their heart and life to Jesus. And you know today that you're lost without him. And you know that you can't make it without him. And today, I just want to invite you, whether you're here in the altar or you're back in your seat, if you would just raise a hand saying, it's me and I'm offering my life to Jesus. Maybe you've known him. Maybe you've been in relationship and you're just not there today. Or maybe you're just saying for the first time, I want to give my life to Jesus. Is there anybody looking to your left, my right? Just look across the room. It's the greatest decision that you could ever make. Right here in the middle, is there anybody? Jesus gave his life so that we could have life. Jesus suffered knowing that we would suffer. How many of you today, you've responded or maybe you're in the seat today and you're, you're going through some problems. There's just some difficulties in your life and you're struggling and you need God's help. Just raise your hand saying, that's me. I'm struggling. I just got life, life issues. It doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean that there's problems with you. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong. It just means that you're a human and you're in this world and you got issues and problems that are facing you that you want to work through and endure through. How many this morning you've got you've got a need of physical healing? You need God to touch you and you need to God to heal your body. How many of you would say that's me? Raise your hand high today. Here's the thing. I don't want us to pray just a little prayer of God please come and heal me if you want to do that. Reports in El Salvador of people who are deaf who now hear because people prayed. It's not us it's God. He's the healer. We just make ourselves available. So if you, get, if you need healing today, would you raise your hand? Look around and see a hand that's near you today. And I want to encourage you either just put a, put a hand on that shoulder or stand with them. Or if you know them or don't know them, just if you would lift them to, to the Lord in prayer today. I want to ask and believe and expect God to do miracles right here in this room. Jesus, we open ourselves to you, God, and say, we cannot do this life without you. We weren't made to do life without you. We need you, God. We need your power in our life to live a victorious, overcoming life for you. God, we want, we want you more than anything. And so, God, we invite you into our situations, into our lives. God, I pray that you would come and meet people at their needs. God, the situations that seem so overwhelming. We understand that there's suffering in the world that we live in and we're not immune to that. But God, it's an opportunity for you to work in our lives to help bring us to a place where you want us to be. 
We know that you are faithful, God, and you won't leave us alone. You won't leave us. You'll, you walk through life. You give us your power, your Holy Spirit to go through that, and you make us better for it, God. I just pray that anyone that has problems or issues or struggles today, God, those that are struggling with addiction, those that are struggling with issues, God, that are maybe just keep them uh, just isolated. God, I pray that you would break those chains and, and that you would open yourself, they would open themselves to you, God, to move in a miraculous way in their life and to change them, God, to clean them, to, to make them a new creation. God, for every person today that says, I need healing in my body, God, would you work miraculously right here in this place today in Urbandale, Iowa, New Hope Assembly of God. There are people, God, who, who are battling cancer. And God, we know that cancer is no match to you. You are a God who can speak and cancer be gone. I, I pray today that you would heal bodies, God, that you would restore lives, that you would restore families and, and, uh, and relationships, God, that you would provide for needs, God, that, that, are, that are here today. God, we're believing you and asking you, believing in your power, not our abilities, but your supernatural ability. God, you can do all things. To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think according to your power that's at work in us. Thank you, God, for that promise. We ask that your power would be at work in the lives of your people to bring praise and honor and glory to you and show how great and good of a God you are. We thank you this morning and we give you thanks and praise for your goodness to us, God. You never, you never let us down. You're a faithful God. He's been faithful. He will be faithful. He'll forever be faithful because he doesn't change. This isn't just pep rally today. I believe it all. It might be a little out of character for me. If you can't tell, I'm a little bit losing my voice. But I believe this, guys. I believe in God. I believe in his power. I believe in his authority. I believe in his goodness. I believe in his presence. God will meet you, and not just in this room. He'll meet you wherever you're at. Don't lose sight. We, in order to live overcoming victorious lives, we've got to have the Spirit of God in us. And if you call on God, he will always answer. And he desires to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit more than anything that you would be filled with his fullness and with his power so that you could live an overcoming life for him. Amen? Amen. Seek him. You'll find him.